Let us take hands and walk together on a frozen pond after dark. The pond has been solid for ten long years. Look, I have found a toy boat, half submerged in white ice, from when the cold waste first took hold. Can there be life down there, dormant in the freeze? Will the warmth of life release it, or give it pain? Some day, friend, you'll know. Until then, discover the delight of drawing with Dolores. <sighs> Greetings, listeners. Uh, I'm back from my personal health vacation, and、uh, back in the saddle and ready to do some art. So it's time to put on your creative glasses and、uh, take a piece of paper and a pencil, and let's get ready to draw. So one thing I learned on my personal health vacation was that sometimes we have to accept、uh, our talents and our challenges. So today I'm I'm going to accept the darkness that is obviously in me, and I'm going to make something beautiful with it. So today we're going to draw the devil. Okay, let's go. So、uh, take your paper and your pencil, and、uh, in the middle of the paper you're gonna draw、uh, a big circle, just. In the center of the paper, this is going to be the devil's face. Okay, you draw your circle. It doesn't have to be perfect.、Uh, we'll cover perfect circles in、uh, another lesson.、Uh, now, in the middle of your circle, very small, right, right in the middle, I want you to draw、uh, an upside-down triangle. This is going to be the tip of the devil's nose. He's a, a very sharp-featured fellow. Okay. Now, under the tip of his nose, you're going to draw、uh, his mustache. So I want you to draw two U's connecting at the base of the triangle, or、uh, a rounded W, whichever makes the most sense to you. That as big as you want, but I like to make it about a third of the width of the circle. Okay, then、uh, above that, you're gonna draw the devil's eyes.、Uh, he's got little small eyes, two circles、uh, above his nose, the beady little eyes of the devil. Okay, and then.、Um, On the top of his head, you're gonna draw on either side uh, uh, inverted V's. Okay, these are gonna be his little his little pointy horns. This is a classical devil. It doesn't have goat horns, just little little tiny points for horns. Okay, and we're almost done. And next, we're going to draw. Uh, coming out from either side of his face, around his mustache area,、uh, three lines jutting out at angles、um, it, on each side. Three of these lines on each side. These are his shouting lines. He's shouting curses at the good people of the world. Okay, and now we have.、Uh, Well, it's ah,、uh, it doesn't look like a devil. <sighs> Give me a minute. I learned about this in my personal health vacation. I'm gonna meditate now. I'm not gonna get angry. I'm going to get relaxed. Okay, not going to get angry. Just getting relaxed. Not gonna get angry. 
Just getting relaxed. Not gonna get angry. Just getting relaxed. <sighs> well, I don't know about you, but I feel relaxed. <sighs> Story time, everyone. Story time. Today's story is The Damning of the Agonia, Part 1. Gather round the fire, children. Granny's got a ghosty tale for you, hasn't she? A tale most dreadful. A spine-chilling story of fiery shipwrecks and lost prisoners. Of forbidden zones in the sea. Listen, as a too proud captain gets his comeuppance when spirits take the helm. But not to worry, pets. Nobody dies. Or does that disappoint you? For how can it be a ghost story when the sailors survive? Trust me when I tell you, darlings, they didn't want to. <laughs> it was 1848 when Captain Alby, Aloysius to his missus back at home, stood upon the deck of the clipper ship Agonia and steeled himself against the driving rain. The wind screamed curses. Cold water knifed the men's faces. But onward, onward, men, I'll be commanded, for they'd see no pay if their cargo of wool was delivered late and maggoty. How much further onward can we go? The sailors wailed. It's hell's own wrath spitting down on us. Indeed, it was the ninth tempest in as many nights. But Captain Alby ignored his crewmen's pleas, for his boots had been quite well sealed by his missus back at home. Not until his first officer, one Mr. Barrymore, threatened mutiny with a musket at a range guaranteed to succeed, did Alby consider that their present course, perhaps, might not. Men, we find ourselves in the midst of a squall, he told his beleaguered crew while he fumbled with his sodden map. Therefore, we are uh, changing course. We'll be sailing west now through the Devil's Spine. Now, you might not know about the spine, but sailors in those days knew it well, as a wide channel studded by an S-shaped formation of tall, thin rocks that jutted from the sea. A shortcut it was, between the southern continent and the motherland, with smooth sailing all the way, or so it was said by those who passed through to safety. But surviving ships were few. Even seafarers who succeeded told tales of an eerie silence, of instruments gone mad, of disturbing shadows in the fog. Better dust for bread and piss for wine than what God forgot neath the devil's spine, goes an old sailor's proverb. But I'll be dismissed these warnings. Utter nonsense, said he. Ghost stories to frighten silly women, such as my missus back at home. So exhausted were the men of the Agonia that none bothered to argue the order now. For what could be worse than this relentless rain? And wouldn't you know it, scarcely had the clipper turned westward when the wind lulled to a gentle breeze and the storm clouds seemed almost to back away. For the next twenty-four and a half hours the sea was like glass and yet the Agonia sailed on as if guided by unearthly hands. By all reason this ought to have set her crew at ease, but not so. Not after what these men had outlived. It ain't right, some said. It's too kind, said others. Kind enough for the captain's missus back at home. Captain Alby heard the joking and had a mind to give the man who said it a good thrashing, but he was to be interrupted by sudden darkness blacker than night itself. The stars vanished. The ship's lanterns extinguished. The men cried out in alarm, but even their voices became muffled in a dense, suffocating and unexpected mist. After a time, the fog dissipated just enough to let in the hazy glow of the moon. There, jutting up with menace from the murky depths, tall, angled figures could be seen. The very stones of the devil's spine. There was a voice. Ahoy! It was a man, a man calling from below. Ahoy! Ahoy! 
Someone managed to relight a lantern and held it out over the Agonia's starboard side. "'Tis a man, sir, a man!' he shouted. "'Of course it's a man,' said Captain Alby. "'I can hear him. But what is he doing all the way out here? Give me that light!' The captain took the lantern and peered down into the water for the source of the voice. The source was, in fact, a man, or what was left of one, floating upon the wreckage of another ship. Aye, he lived, but half his face shimmered with blood in the lantern light. His clothes blackened were as one with his blistering flesh. Captain Alby wretched and turned away, but the man called up to him again, his face so terribly mangled that his words defied understanding. Captain, he's badly hurt, said Barrymore. We must bring him aboard at once. The captain peered down at the man once more. Upon the man's makeshift raft, Alby could just make out large black letters. Revelation, he read aloud. He drew back and handed the lantern to his first mate and said with a sniff, the convict ship headed for Australia when she struck one of the rocks of the spy, no doubt. A sad fate, but I'm afraid the Agonia is no place for creatures of his sort. He would only use the opportunity to escape the Queen's justice. But Captain, came the protest, but Alby was set in his ways. For some men, Mr. Barrymore, tis better to die than to live, he said, and that is all I will hear on the matter. Tell the men to keep watch for the rest of the wreckage. Good night. By now, all the Agonia's lamps and lanterns had been lighted again, revealing her crew's wary, frightened faces. In the settling quiet left behind by that mysterious fog, whispers could be heard as easily as shouting. We shouldn't go on. I don't like this. I never liked this. But what choice have we got? We're here now, aren't we? What if that man was warning us, not asking for rescue? Suppose he wasn't a man but a ghost. Whatever their worries, the Agonia sailed on her way and left behind the unknown prisoner, his voice growing faint as all hope. And then someone screamed. Oh my, look at the time. Sometimes I could swear it moves faster than our watches would have us believe. But you will come back to me soon, won't you? And when you do, I promise I shall tell you the dreadful fate of the Clipper Agonia. Ooh-wee, that story gave me cold shivers. Shivers, huh? After that, I should think you'd get hot sweats. Oh no, not me. I never sweat anymore because I never overheat. That's a bold claim. Bold but true. Just like Dandyfine. Dandyfine, you say? Oh yes. Just one daily spoonful of Dandyfine has all the minerals I need to keep my internal thermometer regulated. So I never overheat or sweat out my precious stores of pet-giving vitamins H and Z, which of course Dandyfine replenishes anyway. Age and Z? You bet. Plus, it's ironized to give you youth and vitality. What else can promise that? Go on, try it. Oh, I don't know. Try it. Okay. Mm. Gee whiz. Why, I feel as regulated as a grandfather clock. That's a marvel of science. That's dandy fine. Let's listen in on our inside voices. I feel great today. For the first time in I don't even know how long, I feel like everything's gonna be okay. It's not just a feeling though. No, I know this time. I've been so stressed out about things with George and I feel so silly about it now that he's here again. And he won't leave me this time. Not until he's learned to see things my way. I just have to remind myself that if it takes a while, it's not because I'm a failure. I'm really too hard on myself. I've learned so much since last time. I just have to be patient and give him the space and time he needs to get used to a situation. And now that I've learned to tie better knots, he's going to be forced to realize that things are better with me if he wants to eat. He's eating now, so that's a good sign. He knocked over the plate I brought him last night, but he might have still been a little groggy from the sedatives. He likes it. I made his favorite. I mean, unless his mom was lying in their family Facebook group. I wanted to ask, but I was logged in with his account and that would have sounded weird. His jaw clicks when he eats, I'm noticing. That's, uh, huh. I didn't notice that when we went out. Of course, we only went out the one time, but I knew we were soulmates even then. Maybe I was too distracted by his handsome face to notice that awful 
little sound. Wow, he's switching the potatoes around in his mouth too, like... I mean, I love him, but who does that? The potatoes are already mashed, you don't need to... Ugh, this is superficial. It's what's inside that counts. But I don't think I make those sounds when I eat. I try to do everything as quietly as possible. Noise is so irritating to everyone around you. It's, oh God, now he's got the potatoes on his lips and he's trying to lick them off and his tongue keeps... Oh, how did I not realize how irritating he is? I honestly, honestly thought he was more refined than that. I feel betrayed, to be honest. He's not who he pretended to be. Oh, I made a horrible mistake. I'm just going to lock the basement and wait and get on with my life. I'm not a procrastinator, but this is one of those cases where if I wait long enough, this problem will fix itself. Ugh, disgusting. And now, ask. Nori writes, I can't stop losing things. It makes everyone mad. How do I stop? Dearest Nori, I'm here for you. And I have a wealth of tips that might help. Get a pen and paper ready. I'll wait. All right, are you ready? Here are my tips for remembering where you've put your various objects. Number one, the instant you put something down, repeat to yourself out loud where you put it. You'll remember the sound of the words. Number two, what color is the object you've put down? Look for something very near to the object that's the same color. For instance, is it a red key? Remember that the key is red. And so is the apple sitting on the table where you placed the key. Number three, what sound does the object make? A key might ring like a bell if you throw it down a well, and it hits the stones as it goes down. Remember that sound. Remember the deep, dark well. Number four. Did you know that all the colors we see are determined by the light in which we see them? Blue isn't really blue if the light is red, but blood is red, and so is the key. Remember the key. Remember blood. Blood is the key. Number five. Ask yourself how the blood got on your hands. Is it metaphorical blood or literal blood? For instance, did you wrongfully cause someone's termination with their employer for your own benefit? Or did you sever their jugular with a jagged key? Number six. Was the murder an act planned and perpetrated by a group of people? Is that why everyone's upset with you? I see. You lost the evidence. That is a pickle. After you've checked everywhere, move to another country. Don't come back. Number seven. Have 40 years gone by without sign of the evidence? Don't get comfortable yet. Remember, you can't go home. Not now, not ever. The missing bloodstained key is their problem now. I hope this brings you comfort. If any other listeners have questions keeping them awake at night, they may ask by spitting upon the roots of a long dead sycamore tree or by sending an email to ask at goodnightdearmargaret.com. Tell me a story about the moment you discovered that someone you looked up to was human. Who sat godlike upon your pedestal, and what was it that reduced them? Were they a parent? a guardian, an older sister or brother? Did they cry in front of you? Did they speak forbidden words in front of you? Did they forget when they should not have? Did they cause harm when they should not have? Did they tell you something they should not have? Did they display an ugliness that changed how you pictured them? What do you feel in your chest when you see lights in other people's windows? Tell me that story. Tell me that story. Now. And now it's time to go back. Before we reach the end of the pond. I'm sorry that I have to leave you, friend. But remember the dawn of the 23rd age. Thank you for coming along. Good night. Good night, dear Margaret. May angels bring you dreams and when comes the sun dear margaret we hope they'll allow you to wake eight five twenty
Good Night, Dear Margaret is written, produced, and narrated by me, Katie Towell. New episodes are posted monthly with a bonus episode for Patreon patrons. Special thanks go out to Chaz Simmons and Colin Hamilton for your support. To learn more, including how to subscribe and support the podcast, visit goodnightdearmargaret.com. Thank you.